This past week has been quite controversial on our Facebook page um, because it's, you know, I think people are, you know, I think change is a brew here. And um, I'm really excited to actually be inviting our next speaker here, Morgane Auger, because I think she's going to be really questioning or making us, you know, consider what the future is going to be like, not only for just us as mothers, but even as our children as they are entering their school system or discovering their identities and all of this stuff. And so it's with great pleasure that I invite Morgan. Morgan is the trans mom of two children and an advocate working to promote social change that improves the lives of transgender and gender variant Canadians. Morgan is the chair of the Trans Alliance Society and a member of the District PAC Executive Committee and the City of Vancouver LGBTQ2 Plus Advisory Committee. It's with great pleasure that I invite Morgan to our stage at Leading Moms today. Hi there. So my name is Morgan Auger and I am trans mom. Um, so I fathered two children and people who hate trans people who are afraid of us keep on reminding me that I was a father once and therefore I can't possibly be a mother. But we'll leave that to them. Um, I have two nearly free range children and I, I co-parent with uh, unfortunately very angry ex 40% um, of the time in shared custody and these are my children but because I'm a transgender advocate I can't show you their faces for a number of reasons but one of the reasons is it puts them at risk because in order to silence me they might be at risk and this has been mentioned in the past so it's a threat that I have to live with on a daily basis is that my children might be a way that uh, people would harm me or the cause that I push for. Anyways, they're in here. This was uh, in France this summer when I finally got my passport to travel to France after I had to escalate to the Canadian Senate Human Rights Standing Committee chair asking if it was special treatment for trans people to have to wait two years to get your documents updated for you while they kept your ID that kept you from leaving the country. Um, two hours later, I had my documents. <laughs> <laughs> so, I wear some advocacy, advocacy hats. It's kind of on your knees advocacy because very few of us have a voice to speak. And um, few of us are able to actually be heard. I'm the chair of the Trans Alliance Society and we do a bunch of stuff. We support advocacy for trans and gender variant communities. Uh, gender variant means um, non-binary gender identified people. So people who don't think of themselves as a man or a woman, but both or neither. And uh, there's a significant number of people who fall in that, uh, in that uh, pile. Uh, about 30% of uh, feminine identified trans people and about 15% uh, of, sorry it's the other way around, 30% of masculine identified and 15% of feminine identified people uh, are non-binary. We do a lot of education and outreach. I specialized in going and speaking to very scary places, like here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, but also uh, actually conservative spaces where uh, transgender identities are foreign or a sin and um, where people just aren't ready yet and we try to bridge and open a little bit. So I work on anti-oppression by poking sticks and eyes of politicians because we're a non-profit, we're not a charity, so we're unleashed. CRA never audits us. Um, and I work on system change, specifically litigation, and human rights complaints and so forth. I have other hats too. I'm just like, uh, like was mentioned in my intro, these three things. I'm now the secretary of the Vancouver School Board District PAC, which was basically done by default because there were only four executives that came back and there were four jobs. So it was that or there'd be no secretary. And uh, City of Vancouver LGBTQ2 Plus Advisory Committee, uh, I work a lot on that, uh, on trans human rights. There have been problems with the City of Vancouver Police Departments 
uh, behavior towards trans people, and that's my pet project. And I'm on the advisory committee of community, which uh, is basically the queer resource center. I have jobs, because the other stuff, actually, nobody pays you to <laughs> beg for your human rights. And so I work for Vision Critical. Um, Vision Critical is the leading consumer intelligence platform provider. They uh, tell companies what their clients want or what their stakeholders want. And my pet business is uh, I work and I own the Pilot House Marina. It's a little tiny marina up at the coast in the Sunshine Coast. It's really pretty. And if I could have my way, I'd live there. But I need to eat. <laughs> OK, gender identity and gender studies. This is the gender bread man version three, person version three. Version three, because it's always uh, moving forward. There are four kinds of identities. There is your biological sex, which actually nobody knows, and you don't even actually know yourselves unless you didn't get IVF. So if you naturally gave birth to your own child without technological help, then you know you're a female. Otherwise, you don't actually know for sure, because there are female-bodied males with, u uh, with uh, uteruses and vaginas, just no ovaries. And one of these males actually gave birth to his own children, twins, in India this year. So it happens, which is fascinating and really makes things complicated. Um, <laughs> You have a sexual attraction, who you love. Um, nobody knows how that develops or if that's a birth genetic thing, hormonal. You have identity, gender identity, which is where I come in. I identify as a um, binary woman, um, a little bit of non-binary in there like everybody else. And then we have the one that actually matters, which is gender expression. What you show the outside world, how you dress, how you talk, how you are taught to behave. And so like you, we show over here, there's all kinds of vari variations of this. You could have attraction to nobody, asexual. You just don't want to ever have sex with anybody. Or you're attracted to everybody. They call them pansexual, or a little bit of both, or changes. Same with... Um, um, uh, sexually attracted, so it was romantically attracted and sexually attracted. Uh, biological sex is how much female you are, because it's actually spectral. There are many, many variations. Or gender expression, and on the very top, of gender identity, how you identify. Next, we're not that rare. We have 200 people here. One of you is non-binary, statistically speaking. Possibly two. Actually, I stacked the deck. There's four or five of you. <laughs> uh, so, first of all, intersex, okay? Intersex is not binary physiological sex. 2% of the population is intersex in Canada. Of that, a significantly lesser per percentage is profoundly intersex. Half a percent of Canadians are gender variant. That's the same as the number of people who rely on wheelchairs yet you don't see us. This is how it translates. 12,000 transgender people in Metro Vancouver, 175,000 transgender people in Canada. We're a lot of people, and some of us are your kids, or might be your kids, and you want to be careful with what you do with your kids, because how you behave and how you build society affects them. This is the dirty, nasty part of being transgender. Violence. These are, my, these are actually my analysis because I'm a numbers geek. I got the report for 2014 from Toronto Police Department on hate crimes, and I mapped out the probability that, it'd be, that, the, hate, that the probability that you would feel a hate crime based on the population you're in. So it's basically the number of hate crimes divided by the size of the population you're in, which brings you to, of course, me right here. And then up here, gay black men. And over here, LGBT men. If you look at that, that's like pretty much the entire pie for hate crimes, it, violent hate crimes. So these were assaults and uh, assaults causing bodily harm and threatening assault with bodily harm. So now this brings us to us. The 
important thing to remember is that, um, going back to this slide here, there's another kind of violence, which is the violence that causes suicide. Uh, trans youth and trans children, when they come out in Canada today, have a one in three chance of being thrown out of their house permanently and irrevocably by their parents on the spot. It's so, it's so bad that when I advise trans youth when they're gonna come out, I tell them to take their birth certificate and any ID they have and any money or anything valuable and go and put it at a friend's house. Because chances are, one of three of them will never see those, you know, will never see their room again, will never have access to that data. And that's really important because suicidality, it turns out, decreases significantly if you're supported by your family. Trans kids who are supported in their community do just fine, they do like everybody else. But trans kids who are not supported by the community have an insanely high suicide rate, so high that it skews high school suicide numbers. And it looks like the queer kids are the ones who make it look like teenagers commit suicide a lot, whereas it's mostly just the trans and queer kids who do it. So I love this quote. Oprah Winfrey, I used to live in Chicago, so she's my homie. <laughs> and um, biology is the least of what makes someone a mother. I, of course, believe that really a lot. But I think it's important to remember, right? So I'm the extreme case, okay? I'm so, I'm the natal parent, father of two children. I'm their mom. Um, but there are uh, adoptive parents, all these things. There are uh, lesbian couples, gay couples. There are trans men who give birth to their children. Um, all these people should be visible and, th and should be counted, right? So these are all the good things that you can tell your, your mother with, you know? They would rather cry on your shoulder than into a tissue. That's a good one, I think. You never leave the house without a hug. Your child loves spending time with you, well, until they're a teenager. <laughs> um, they say please and thank you without being told. I, actually, my kids don't know how to do that, so. I'm not that good a mother in that aspect. And uh, I think this one is an important one. You put their need to eat and breathe and bathe before your own. Um, I've had to really tone down my advocacy and my work just because I have children, because of the risk. And, um, and it's amazing how often, as in systematically, the fact that I have children has been used to keep me from speaking up or standing up for myself because it's so easy to make a parent quiet uh, because they're afraid that something's gonna, uh, bad is gonna happen to their, to their children. And um, a lawyer who I trust very much warned me, not so long ago as in when I was considering coming here, and she told me to remember what happened to the lesbian moms in the 70s who did what I'm doing right now. They lost their children. And uh, most of them never got to have their custody again, never got to spend time with their children again. And uh, this lawyer, who's my lawyer, warned me that she wasn't sure she could protect me if somebody tried that against me because I'm speaking up as a trans mom. Why explicit enumeration of trans rights in BC and federal human rights law is needed? This is something I'm working on. <laughs> And this is a quote from the government of Canada in 1996 when they made sexual identity protected on the Human Rights Code. The inclusion of sexual orientation in the act was an express declaration, as in they just wanted to put it there so you read it, by Parliament that gay and lesbian Canadians are entitled to an opportunity equal with other individuals to make for themselves the lives they're able to and wish to have. In other words, you have to enumerate identities in the Human Rights Code to protect people from a accidental or purposeful harm. And this slide is uh, show was sent out on Twitter and there's some resources if anybody would like them. And I've got 10 seconds left.